Hey, praise the Lord. Greetings, everybody. My name is Clinton. To those of you who are in Christ Jesus, you know me as Brother Clinton, and this is the Word Prophet Channel, a Christian ministry dedicated to the purpose of teaching the Word of God to the people in the churches of God so that we can go back to serving God in spirit and in truth, as our Lord Jesus Christ commanded. This book is my Holy Bible, King James Version. For those of us who speak English, this is the Word of God. Other versions of the Bible in English that are worded differently than this Bible are not the Word of God, and they can't be the Word of God, because according to the Word of God, it's not possible for two books that don't say the same thing to both be God's Word. As it is written, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Praise the Lord. That the man of God may be perfect. What does this mean? It means that the man of God may have the perfect knowledge of the truth. That he may have the scripture in him. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee as it is written. So it stands to reason, according to God's word, that if your Bible doesn't say the same thing as my Bible, then we can't both be perfect in the knowledge of the word of God because your Bible says something different than what my Bible says. So both of our Bibles cannot be proper or, or, or usable for correction, reproof, doctrine, or instruction in righteousness. They can't be profitable for those things if they don't say the same thing. So it's only possible for one translation of the Bible in any given language to be given by inspiration of God and profitable for reproof, doctrine, correction, and instruction in righteousness. And in the English language, that would be this Bible, the Holy Bible, King James Version. And this is also very important concerning the particular area of doctrine that I'm going to be talking to you about, because if you have one of the New Age perverted Bibles, like the New International Version or the New American Standard Bible or the Today's English Version or many of the other, any of the other perverted translations that are so readily available nowadays to the devil's children by the devil's churches, your Bible is not going to say the same thing as my Bible in many instances concerning the verses of Scripture that we're going to be looking at today. So if you have your Holy Bible, King James Version, and you should, please turn with me to the Ten Commandments, the book of Exodus, chapter 20. That which I'm going to speak to you about is the concept of adultery. What is adultery, according to the title of this video? Now, I totally understand that I'm on YouTube right now, and YouTube isn't the Church of Jesus Christ. So there's many of you out there, although you're welcome to and, and encouraged to listen to the message in this video, there are many of you out there who are not Christians and you're watching this video and you're welcome to be here and, and of course I'm glad that you're here but there may be some things that I'm going to say in this video that are going to sound wrong or even offensive to you and that's because it's what God's Word says and what God's Word says is totally contrary to what the world says there is someone who is described in the Bible as the prince of the power of the air the God of this world that is Satan Satan is the god of this world, god with a little g. He is the prince of this world. He is the prince of the power of the air. And I grew up under his leadership until I became a Christian, and so did you. And if you haven't become a Christian yet and become subject to Jesus Christ as your Lord, then you're still under the, the tutelage of the god of this world. And so the things that you have learned, even if you've been going to church your whole life, are from the devil, because most churches out there are of the devil. And so, and I say that without any reservation or hesitation, and if you have any questions about that, please feel free to post your question in the comment form, and I'll be happy to send you one of several public videos that I have on this channel, which will explain that for you. But, as I've said many times before, the act of going to church is a vain religious ritual. It is religious entertainment for sinners, and it's given to you by Rome. The same Rome that gives you professional football and hockey and basketball and the music industry and Hollywood and and all of the useless, shiny, little, nonsensical things that keep you distracted from what you should be doing, which is abiding in God's Word. Because Jesus said, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And going to church is one of the many things that hinders people from doing just that. Which is why most people, including myself in time past, have a wrong conception or a wrong... Um, perception of the things that are that are going on in the world and a wrong perception of what God's Word says. 
because they judge what God's word says by what they've heard in church instead of God's word. And I used to do the same thing. I'm not, I'm not railing on you or anybody. But that's why I'm here, you see, to present to you the word of God so that we can go back to serving God in spirit and in truth. Praise the Lord. So in the book of Exodus chapter 20, we read of how God gave to the people of Israel the Ten Commandments. And not just to the people of Israel, to the whole world. The law is for everybody. And so God said in Exodus chapter 20, verse 14, Thou shalt not commit adultery. This is the seventh of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not commit adultery. And he also said, which we can read in verse 17, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. This is what I want to talk to you about. What is adultery? There are, according to the scripture, there are only two ways that a man can commit adultery. In, in the sense of human relationships. And the reason that I say in the sense of human relationships is because a man can be an adulterer spiritually. He can say that he serves God and go after other gods, which are no gods. That's adultery also. But that's not what I'm going to be talking to you about in this video. The reason that people commit adultery spiritually is because they're already adulterers in their hearts. So what I want to talk to you about is the concept of adultery in a human sense, in a sense of human relationships men and women okay so there are only two ways according to the scripture that a man can commit adultery one of those ways is to take another man's wife and lie with her carnally the other one is for a man who is married to put away his wife and marry another woman those are the only two ways that a man can be guilty of the sin of adultery according to the scripture so let's talk about the first one first let's go to matthew chapter 5 Matthew chapter 5 may God bless the reading of his word we're going to start with I believe verse 27 yay and it says ye have heard that it was said by them of old time thou shalt not commit adultery okay so what's Jesus talking about here he's talking about committing adultery but I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery already with her in his heart. And then he goes on to say, And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And again, if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. What is Jesus talking about here? Well, again, he's talking about adultery. Okay? Ye have heard it said, pardon me, ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. Jesus was preaching to the people of Israel, and he's also preaching to us by the scripture. And he said, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Why was it said by them of old time? Because it was written in the law, in the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not commit adultery. So then Jesus says, But I say unto you, Remember, Jesus came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill. And he came to magnify the law. He was teaching the law to the people of Israel. That is the job of a rabbi. And that's what Jesus was. He was a teacher which is called in Hebrew a rabbi. Okay, He was an apostle, he was a prophet, he was a teacher, he was a pastor, and he was an evangelist. And so he has set those things in the churches, and he, has, he himself fulfilled all those things. Jesus is our apostle, he is, our, he is that prophet, he is our teacher, uh, he is an evangelist, and he is, a, what did I say, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. He is all those things. And so he has ordained those things in his church that men of God may fulfill those positions and offices in, in the church of Jesus Christ as well. We who follow him to do the things that he did to feed the sheep. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And so here he was teaching the people of Israel and he's teaching us by the scripture. And he says, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. 
Okay. Now there are many, 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 many people who misunderstand what Jesus said here. And it's not hard to understand. But the thing that, that causes people to misunderstand it is their unfamiliarity with the Word of God and the Kingdom of God and the indoctrination that we have been exposed to all of our lives in Roman society. Because we live in Roman society. We live under the rulership of Rome. The same Roman kingdom that was ruling the world in the days when Jesus spoke these words is still ruling today. And if you doubt that, just Google Vatican City and look at the Roman emperor sitting right there on his throne. He's called the Pope. He's the Roman emperor. Roman emperors have been called popes for the last 1,700 years. They're still the Roman emperors. And we live under the, the rule of the Roman Empire in this world. And the Roman Empire is disguised by faux institutions that are called democracies. Those are just puppets. Those are just put there to disguise the fact that we are living under the Roman Empire. That's who is controlling the things of this world today. Under the leadership of the God of this world, with a little g, which is Satan. Praise the Lord. So, we were all taught wrong. But Jesus said, I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Let's look at this verse of the scripture. What is a woman? A woman is a word used in the scripture to describe a female who is married. That's what a woman is. When we read the scripture and we read of a female who is not married, she is not called a woman, generally speaking. I, don't, I, I can't think of every instance in the Bible of the word woman, but generally speaking, the word woman is not used to refer to an unmarried female. An unmarried female is called a damsel or a maid or a maidservant. Okay, this is what an unmarried female is called. A female who is a virgin, who is living in her father's house, who is not married to anyone, she is called a virgin or a damsel or a maid or a maidservant. She is not called a woman. A woman is a female who is married. How do we know this? Well, we know this just because of proper English. And I know that there are many who say that, that the King James Bible is Old English. Old English. Or some people even think it was written by Shakespeare uh, because they're so uneducated, unfortunately, that they don't know the difference between proper English and the modern vernacular, which is incorrect. It's highly perverted. But this Bible is not Old English. It's proper English. It's proper, correct English. And it's written this way on purpose in English. Uh, there are many reasons that the, the, the Holy Bible King James Version is correct in many instances in comparison to the modern perversions of the, of, of the Bible because the modern perversions of the Bible use the modern vernacular in English which is not the correct way to express what was written in the original manuscripts. And so, and I won't go into all that right now, but this is one of those instances Okay, the word woman does not refer to an unmarried female. And so if a man looks upon an unmarried female to lust after her, has he committed adultery? Well, how could he have committed adul adultery with her if she's not married to anybody? The answer is obviously that he cannot. You cannot commit adultery with a woman who isn't married. If she's not married, you could commit fornication with her, but you cannot commit adultery with her. Even if you're a married man, you cannot commit adultery with a woman who is not married. The Bible does not say that a married man who looks upon an unmarried woman to lust after her is committing adultery. But many people think, they just assume incorrectly, that that's a sin. And it isn't a sin. What is a sin is to lust after another man's wife. This is the tenth commandment, Exodus 20, verse 17. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. This is what Jesus was teaching here. Jesus was teaching that thou shalt not commit adultery and thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife are the same thing. Because if you covet your neighbor's wife, what does it mean to covet? To covet something that belongs to your neighbor means to devise means and ways in your mind to take that thing from your neighbor because you want it. So you want to take it away from your neighbor. That's what it means to covet. Now, if I walk into a store 
and I only have four dollars in my pocket and I see something that I would like to have but that thing costs five dollars I have a choice to make in my mind now if I stand there for a moment and I think you know nobody's in the store nobody can see me right now I could take this thing and walk out of the store with it and nobody would see me if I think that have I sinned no I have not sinned but if I stand there and keep thinking about that until I wind up taking that thing off the shelf and putting it in my pocket and walking out of the store without paying for it then have I sinned yes I have sinned I am a thief because I stole that thing from the store where did my sin begin it began when I began to meditate in my heart about stealing that thing because Jesus said out of the heart of man proceed evil thoughts adultery fornication thefts blasphemy and evil eye and so on and so forth so you see if I'm meditating on something that is evil that is sinful the end result is that either I'm going to cast that thought down and not do that thing or I'm going to keep meditating on it until I do it and if I keep meditating on it until I do it then it becomes sin lust when it hath conceived bringeth forth sin and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death so if I'm lusting after something that doesn't belong to me whether it's a five dollar item in a store that I don't that I can't afford because I only have four dollars or whether it's my neighbor's wife which I can't have because she belongs to my neighbor if I'm meditating on stealing that thing until I finally steal it, then I am a thief. Or in the case of my neighbor's wife, I am an adulterer. Where did my sin begin? It began in my heart. It began in my heart when I began to meditate upon my neighbor's wife, lusting after my neighbor's wife and thinking in my heart, when could I get alone with her? I just need a moment alone with her to tell her that I want to get with her that's lusting after your neighbor's wife and that's what Jesus was talking about in this passage and that's the only thing that Jesus was talking about in this passage ye have heard that it was said by them of old time thou shalt not commit adultery but I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart and if thy right eye offend thee pluck it out and cast it from thee for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off. In other words, if thou hast touched thy neighbor's wife, or thy hand wants to touch thy neighbor's wife, it would be better for you to cut your hand off than to sin against God. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. See, so if your eye is coveting your neighbor's wife, or if your hand is desiring to, 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 to touch your neighbor's wife, and you are unable to control your eye or your hand, then it would be better to cut it off than to perish in hell because of your hand. See, and this is, of course, put in a parabolic form because your hand doesn't have a mind of its own, and your eye doesn't have a mind of its own. These things are controlled by your heart. And so if you have a problem with your eye or your hand, the problem isn't with your eye or your hand, it's with your heart. And so you need to get your heart right with God. You need to stop meditating on evil things and start meditating on the Word of God day and night as we are commanded. Praise the Lord. And this is what Jesus was teaching. Remember, Jesus came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. He didn't come to change the law of Moses. He came to magnify the law that he gave to Moses in the beginning. And he came to teach and that's why they called him rabbi and master, for so he is. Praise the Lord. So this is one way that a man can commit adultery, either by coveting his neighbor's wife, which is going to wind up in him doing something with his neighbor's wife that he shouldn't be doing, and that's the other half of it. If a man lies carnally with his neighbor's wife, he has committed adultery, because his neighbor's wife is not his. It's another man's property. Okay, just like a man's servants and his house and his horse or his ox or his ass, anything that is thy neighbor's, as it's written in the 10th commandment, thou shalt not covet anything that is thy neighbor's. And his wife is his property. She belongs to him. She's bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. She's called by his name. So eyes off, hands off. She's not available. So forget about it. It doesn't matter how beautiful she is. It doesn't matter how sweet she is. It doesn't matter how sexy she seems to you. Hands off, eyes off. 
Okay, That's not on the table. You can't have that. So forget about having that. Okay, But one thing that's very important for us to understand is that Jesus did not say, Whosoever looketh on a maid to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. He did not say that. He said a woman. And the reason that he said a woman was because he was talking about a female who is married to another man. And we know that not only because of our understanding of English, but also because of the fact that Jesus was speaking about one thing and one thing only in this passage of the scripture. He was talking about adultery. That's what adultery is. When a man lies down with another man's wife, that's adultery. Okay. What is the other instance of adultery? We're, we're in Matthew 5, so let's just keep going, and, and we're going to read verses 31 and 32. It says, It hath been said, <clears throat> Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. Okay. So let's take the last part first. Why is he that marries her who is divorced committing adultery? For the same reason that I just explained to you. Because a divorced woman is still another man's wife. Because it is written, the, the wife is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. So if a woman, if a man marries a woman and then they both go to a judge and they get a divorce, she's still his wife because he's still alive. Okay, the judge has granted them a divorce concerning the marriage contract that he and his wife have with the state. But the judge has not granted them a divorce concerning the blood covenant that they have with each other, which is for life. And he doesn't, he can't give them a divorce for that because he doesn't have the authority to do that. Because Jesus said, What God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. When a man marries a wife, as long as she's not anybody else's wife at the time, then she becomes bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. She is bound to him for the rest of his life. Okay? So if they get a divorce, they're still married. She's still another man's wife. And if you've married some a woman who is divorced from her husband and he's still alive, then you're living in adultery with another man's wife. Period. It doesn't matter why they were divorced. It doesn't matter if one of them was unfaithful or if the man became a sodomite or if the woman became a lesbian or whatever. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Okay? She's still another man's wife. And so you're committing adultery with another man's wife if you're married to a divorced woman. But let's go back to the earlier part of the verse. He said, Whosoever shall put away his wife saving for the cause of fornication causeth her to commit adultery. Okay. Saving for the cause of fornication is a phrase that refers to Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 and 2, which says, When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes because he hath found some uncleanness in her, then let him give her a writing of divorcement and put it in her hand and send her out of his house, and she may go and be another man's wife. This is very clear. I know that it's there's a lot of confusion. A lot of people are confused about it, just like the Pharisees and the Sadducees were confused about it in the time when Jesus spoke these words. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees are still confused about it today, and they argue about it all the time. But it's really very simple. When a man hath taken a wife and married her, okay, when he hath purchased a wife from her father, given the father a dowry, and taken a young virgin to himself to wife, he hath betrothed her unto himself, and it come to pass that when he marries her, when he takes her into the marriage bed to marry her, he finds out that she's not a virgin like her father said she was when he purchased her. So he can give her at that time, if he desires to, a writing of divorcement. He doesn't take her to a judge and get a divorce. He writes out a writing of divorcement and he puts it in her hand and he sends her out of his house. That means that their marriage covenant is broken because it wasn't consummated and because she was found to be unfaithful. Fornication. That's what fornication means in the context of a marriage. It means when a betrothed wife has been found to have been unfaithful to her husband before their wedding night. That's what fornication means. That's why Jesus said except for fornication. It's very simple. It doesn't apply to a man and a woman who are married and have been living together as husband and wife for five years or ten years or whatever, and one of them becomes unfaithful. That's not what this is talking about. Because the punishment for a woman committing adultery is death by stoning. It's, it's, it's not 
um, a, a writing of divorcement. So this is what this means. And Jesus said that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. Why is he causing her to commit adultery? Because he is forcing her out of his house unlawfully. If, he, if he's not putting her away for the cause of fornication, if he's putting her away for any other cause, then he's putting her out of his house unlawfully. And she is his wife. She's bound to him by the law as long as he lives. And it's his responsibility to provide for her her food, her raiment, and her duty of marriage, as it's written in Exodus chapter 21, verse 10. Let's go there. Just hold your place in Matthew. Let's look at Exodus chapter 21. Right after God gave the Ten Commandments, he started teaching Moses these things, and it's written in Exodus 21, 10. If he take him another wife, her food, her raiment, and her duty of marriage shall he not diminish. Now, in this passage of Scripture, God was speaking to Moses specifically about a, one, a, a young uh, uh, maid who was sold. Let's just read the whole passage. Start in verse 7. And if a man sell his daughter to be a maidservant, she shall not go out as the men servants do. What is a maidservant? It is a maid who is sold to be a servant. A maid is a word for a young female who is not married. And if a man sell his daughter to be a maidservant, she shall not go out as the men servants do. If she please not her master, who hath betrothed her to himself, then shall he let her be redeemed. To sell her unto a strange nation he shall have no power, seeing he hath dealt deceitfully with her. And if he have betrothed her unto his son, he shall deal with her after the manner of daughters. If he take him another wife, her food, her raiment, and her duty of marriage shall he not diminish. Okay, so he may not put her away or sell her to a strange nation and take another wife. If he has betrothed her to himself, he has the responsibility to provide her food, her raiment, and her duty of marriage. Okay? All right? As long as she's serving him in his house, his responsibility is to give her these things. Now, if she decides not to serve him in his house and to leave his house and go you know, do something else and not, not serve her husband, then she has no right to her food, her raiment, and her duty of marriage. But as long as she's abiding in his house and serving him, then... It is his responsibility to provide those things for her. And if he puts her out of his house against her will and against the law, by, by divorcing her against the law, then he is causing her to commit adultery because she's going to wind up in the arms of another man. Because she needs her food, her raiment, and her duty of marriage. And if he's not giving her those things, then she's going to wind up getting them from another man. And when she does that, she's going to be committing adultery. It's really very simple. See? Praise the Lord. So let's go to Matthew chapter 19, where Jesus said the same thing, but a little bit differently. Matthew chapter 19, verse 9, Jesus said, And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. So, in Matthew 5.32, he said that he was causing her to commit adultery. But in Matthew 19.9, he says that the man himself commits adultery. So how is the man committing adultery? By divorcing his wife and marrying another woman. Okay, let's say Bob and Jane have been married. They're living together for, you know, in marriage for five years. Let's just say that, for example. Bob and Jane got married five years ago. They've been living together as husband and wife for five years. And now um, Jane gets upset because Bob has been um, looking at other women or looking at pornography. Or even, let's just say that Bob has an office and he has a secretary and he and his secretary have been fooling around and doing things that they shouldn't be doing. So she decides to divorce her husband. Okay? And her husband, no, that's not a good, exa that's not a good example. Let's, let's put it the other way around. Let's say that Bob gets upset with his wife because he thinks that uh, she is a secretary and she thinks that he's, she's fooling around with her boss. Okay? This will fit the, 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 uh, the story. So Bob divorces his wife because she thinks that she's, Pardon me, because Bob thinks that his wife is fooling around with another man. And so, because Bob has put away his wife for his suspicion of her fooling around with another man, and Bob's pastor is a fake pastor that graduated from a seminary, so he's probably told Bob that he has the right to do so, contrary to the scripture. Bob has put away his wife contrary to the law. He's not allowed to put away his wife because she's fooling around with another man. Okay, so Bob is not allowed to put away his wife and marry another woman. And so if Bob has put away his wife, um, contrary to the law, then he is committing adultery against her if he marries another woman. Why? Because he's taking what belongs to his wife 
and he's giving it to another woman. He's taking that which is belongs to his wife, that is her food, her raiment, and her duty of marriage, and he is giving those things to another woman. Therefore, he's committing adultery against his wife. He's not committing adultery by marrying another woman because he can marry another woman if he wants to. There's nothing unlawful about that as long as that other woman isn't married to anyone else. But the sin is that he has put away one to marry another. And he's put away one unlawfully. It wasn't for the cause of fornication. It was because she was committing adultery. And there is no provision in God's law for a man to put, his, put away his wife for the cause of adultery. There is no provision in God's law for that. So if his wife is committing adultery, then what he needs to do is go to her boss and tell her, my wife quits and she's going to be at home with me and he should not permit his wife to leave the house anymore. Okay, And if she can't be trusted with her phone, then he takes away her phone. And so he, he causes her to be faithful to him in his house. Okay, If you can't be trusted with your phone, then you don't have a phone anymore. And if I can't trust you to go outside, then guess what? You're not going outside anymore. You're my wife. And you're not going to be with another man, period. He has the right to do that. He does not have the right to divorce her because of those things, because of adultery. And so it is that if he puts her away and marries another woman, he's committing adultery against her by taking away that which pertains to her and giving it to another woman. Because now she doesn't have her food, her raiment, and her duty of marriage. And what's she going to do? Well, she's probably going to go over to her former boss's house and marry him. If he divorces her, she's probably going to go to her boss's house and marry him. And then she's going to be committing adultery. It's going to be his fault. And he's going to be committing adultery against her by taking the things that she has need of that his responsibility is to give her and giving it to another woman. Okay. Now, if Bob wants to marry another woman, then he can certainly do that. And he can have two wives in his house if he wants to, as long as he's not um, neglecting to give to both of them their food, their raiment, and their duty of marriage. If Bob wants to marry a, wife, a second wife, that's not a sin, but he needs to make sure that he gives unto his first wife the things that pertain unto her. And that doesn't mean to pay her when she's not living in his house. That means to have her living in his house and give to her the things that she has need of. Praise the Lord. Now, if she just leaves and she doesn't want anything to do with Bob, and she just leaves his house and doesn't want to live there anymore, then he doesn't have any responsibility to give her her food, her raiment, and her duty of marriage because she is left on her own. But if he puts her away to marry another woman, then he's committing adultery. He's committing adultery by not providing for her the things that she has need of. And that's also going to cause her to go and commit adultery because she's going to go to another man so that she can receive those things because she needs those things to live. Praise the Lord. So these are the two ways that a man can commit adultery in, this, in a human sense, in the sense of human relationships, according to the scripture. Either a man can put away his wife and marry another woman, and so he's committing adultery against her by withholding from her the things that she has need of, her food, her raiment, and her duty of marriage. He's depriving her of those things if he puts her away unlawfully and marries another woman and gives those things to his, his new wife. And also, a man is committing adultery if he's coveting his neighbor's wife, which is also going to lead to him having a, having a, committing an act of adultery with his neighbor's wife. See, because all those evil thoughts come from the heart and defile the man. So if a man is coveting his neighbor's wife, then he's going to wind up committing adultery with his neighbor's wife. And that's why Jesus taught, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever shall look upon a woman to lust after her in her heart hath, pardon me, whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Why? Because he's already planning how he's going to commit adultery with her. See? So, coveting a man's wife is going to lead to committing adultery with her. And it is written, thou shalt not commit adultery. So, these are the two ways, according to the Bible, that a man can commit adultery. Okay? He can either put away his wife and marry another woman. That's committing adultery against his wife and causing her to commit adultery as well. Or, he can be coveting his neighbor's wife, which will eventually lead to him lying down with his neighbor's wife and touching her in ways that are inappropriate. And that's adultery because she's another man's property. And that's not allowed. Okay, praise the Lord. So these are the two ways, according to the scripture, that a man can be guilty of adultery. 
I hope that this message will be a blessing to you. If there are things in this message that you didn't understand and that they seem wrong or odd to you, please don't judge what I say by what you've been taught in church or what you have previously believed by reading books or watching videos. Please judge the things that I say only according to what is written in the Holy Bible, the King James Version. Okay, and, and that which I spoke to you in the beginning of this video about other versions of the Bible is very important because, in, especially in these two verses, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 32, and Matthew chapter 19, verse 9, the Holy Bible says, saving for the cause of fornication. But other Bibles, false Bibles, have taken out that phrase that Jesus said, and they've replaced it with, except for adultery or except for sexual immorality. Sexual immorality is a very popular phrase used in the false Bibles, the New Age Antichrist Bibles. And the problem with the phrase sexual immorality is, well, number one, it's not written in the scripture anywhere. And number two, sexual immorality is a relative term that could mean different things to different people. But fornication is a definite term. It means one thing and one thing only in the context of a marriage. It means when a betrothed wife has been found guilty of being unfaithful to her husband before their wedding. That's what except for fornication means. That's the only thing that it means, and that's very clearly set forth in the Scripture in both the Old and the New Testaments. So when you take out that word except for fornication and you change it to a relative term, sexual immorality, then you change the meaning of the whole sentence. Because sexual immorality could be different things to different people. To one man, sexual immorality might be his wife was watching pornography. To one woman, sexual immorality might be they were sitting on a park bench and a, and a cute little girl walked by and her husband was looking at her behind. To a wife, that, that, you know, to a particular woman, that might be sexual immorality. Okay? And that's why sexual immorality is a phrase that is not found in the scripture, because it's confusing and it's, it's a relative term that can mean anything to anybody. And so because of that, because of the false Bibles, and also the false pastors and the false churches who come from seminaries, which are ordained by the Jesuits of Rome, there are many people who think that because their wife or their husband um, committed adultery, that that's an act of sexual immorality and that they have the right to divorce their husband or wife and marry somebody else. And that's not the case. And that's one of the very, uh, th that's one of the very many dangerous aspects of having a false Bible where the words are changed around to change the doctrine of Christ into something that it's not. Because Jesus did not mention anything about sexual immorality. He didn't mention those words at all. I know that he spoke in Greek or Aramaic, but he didn't mention those words at all. The phrase sexual immorality is not found anywhere in the Holy Bible. And so if you have a Holy Bible that uses that phrase, then your, your Bible isn't holy. It just has holy stamped on the front cover. But it's not God's word. It was translated from corrupted manuscripts. And it was translated from those corrupted manuscripts on purpose. It wasn't to make it easier to read. It was to make it deceptive so that it will fool people into living in sin instead of living in obedience to God. So that's one of the very many, pardon me, that's one of the very, let me speak English if I may, that's one of the many very deceptive points of the New Age Bible versions, which are sold to people under the guise of being e easier to understand and also under the guise of having been based on um, earlier and more reliable manuscripts. Okay, whenever you see the phrase earlier and more reliable manuscripts, you can know that that's a lie, that somebody's lying to you. Okay, you have no way of knowing whether they're based on earlier and more reliable manuscripts. It just says that. Okay, just like you can buy a pack of food at the supermarket and it says on the front, all natural. Well, what does all natural mean? It, it means that it came from, from the earth. It doesn't mean that it doesn't have chemicals and pesticides and, and other kinds of poisons in it. You know, they can fill it with pesticides and poisons and they can still write all natural on the front. And that's perfectly legal because it is, because those pesticides and poisons, where did they come from? They came from the earth. You see, so you can buy a package of food that says all natural on it, thinking that it's pure and it doesn't have any, you know, chemicals or, 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 or poisons in it, but that all natural doesn't mean that it doesn't have those things in it. It's just a phrase that's put there to fool you. Just like when people come to you and they say, oh, this Bible is based on earlier and more uh, reliable manuscripts. Well, that's a lie. 
They're based on manuscripts that are purposely corrupted in order to turn you away from the truth of God. That's why, in the English language, the King James Bible is the Word of God. So if your Bible says sexual immorality, then your Bible isn't the Word of God. And it was put into your hands by the devil to fool you. Because if you're living in, in adultery with another man's wife, if you're married to a woman and, and she commits adultery, and so you divorce her and marry another woman, then you're committing adultery against her. And you're ca causing her to commit adultery when she goes and marries some other man. When she goes and marries another man, that's your fault. And you're going to stand before God and give account for it because you put her away contrary to the law. Because there is no provision in God's law for you to put away your wife for the cause of adultery. There isn't. And the fact that your pastor told you that if she commits adultery, that that's sexual immorality, and he shows you in his false Bible that Jesus supposedly said, except for sexual immorality, and you believe that, and then you stand before God on the day of judgment and say, well, my pastor showed me from this other Bible. And, and the Lord will say, well, that pastor wasn't serving me and that Bible wasn't my word. And if you had sought me, I would have shown you which Bible is my word. And I would have shown you the truth of the matter. And you would not have been living in adultery. But now you've been living in adultery. So depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And there will be no time for repentance at that point. You will be cast into the lake of fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Because you committed adultery and were living in adultery. And for those of you who have married another man's wife and, and you say, well, uh, they, she, she divorced this man because he was mean to her and he did this and that to her. And I'm not going to say that that doesn't matter because it's important that, that people treat one another well. But it doesn't matter in the sense of the fact that she's another man's wife. It doesn't matter why she was divorced from her husband. It doesn't matter. If he beat her up or if he became a homosexual or if he was a skirt chaser or if he brought you know women home to have sex with in their bed all the time while she was outside cleaning the yard or whatever, it doesn't matter. She's still his wife. She's still his wife. The wife is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. That means as long as her husband is still breathing, she is his wife. And if she divorced him because of he mistreated her or whatever, and you're married to her now, you're living in open adultery with another man's wife. You're living in open adultery with another man's wife. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. You know, and she might say, well, my husband committed sexual immorality. Well, that's irrelevant because the Bible doesn't say anything about that. The Holy Bible, God's Word, doesn't say anything about that. So she believed her false pastors and her false Bible. And why did she believe her false pastors and her false Bible? Because that's what she wanted to believe. And why have you believed your false pastors and your false Bible? Because that's what you wanted to believe. Because you are lovers of yourselves and not lovers of God. You are lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. The pleasure that you enjoy by having your sexual intimacy with another man's wife is of greater value to you than what God has set forth in his word. That's why you listened to those false pastors, and that's why you bought those false Bibles and believed the lies that were written therein. But if you had sought God in his word and in prayer, then you would know that this is the word of God, if you speak English. And so that's the difference, and a very important difference. And this is just one example of the differences between this Bible, the Holy Bible, the real Holy Bible, and those other books that have Holy Bible stamped on the front cover, but are translated purposely from corrupted manuscripts in order to deceive people into living in sin and disobedience and rebellion before the living God. Praise the Lord. May this message be a blessing to all those who have ears to hear. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.